am incredibly pleased to see this turnout today. I really thank all of you for coming. I'm going to try to make it worthwhile. Uh, I've just come from Israel, and if I told the festival organizers this, they'd probably had heart attacks because my plane came in this morning. <laughs> Uh, I, I had a unique chance to go there because uh, the Mount Carmel caves, uh, this is a view of the Wadi Maharat at, at Mount Carmel, and this is Taboon Cave, which preserves the deepest stratigraphy of human evolution from 400,000 years ago up until about 50,000 years ago, including uh, a complete Neanderthal skeleton. School Cave, which is over here, um, has a series of burials of some of the earliest anatomically modern humans anywhere outside of Africa. This is uh, about 100,000 to 120,000 years old. El Wad Cave, which is here, is, uh, is deepest uh, in its Natufian evidence. The Natufians are the people who lived immediately before the domestication of plants and animals. So these are sedentary hunter-gatherers who are developing the social systems that are necessary to become agriculturalists. And these caves are now a World Heritage Site. They just had a UNESCO event to recognize their designation, and I got invited to it. So I was really pleased to be able to do that. Um, this is an exciting place, because this is the place where modern humans, as we understand them, and Neanderthals, as we understand them, were encountering each other. When I ask the question, are we the last Neanderthals, understand that this question has two sides, right? Which is the other side being, are Neanderthals the first humans? And are we really different from them? As I'm going to tell you, almost all of us have around about 3% of our ancestry. So out of all of your ancestors who lived 100,000 years ago, 97% of them or around that were Africans. 3% of them or around that were Neanderthals. However, I mean, that's not a huge contribution, right? You'd say 3%. Well, that's 3%. 3% in your genealogy is more or less like one of your great, great, great grandparents. So if you know your genealogy and you go back that, you know, five generations, think one of them could be a Neanderthal. <laughs> that's not really what it means, but if you imagine going back from yourself to your parents, to your grandparents, to your great grandparents, tracing those lines backwards in time so far back that you've gone back 100,000 years. That's, that's a long time, and in fact, it's a lot of branches. There are, there are just trillions and trillions of ways that your genealogy is woven through there. Around about 3% of your ancestors at that time were Neanderthals. If you think about it this way, this is true of almost everybody in the world. It's less true in sub-Saharan Africa, where they have much less. We don't know if it's zero, but it's much less. Think about it in terms of numbers. Today, there are six billion people living in the world outside of sub-Saharan Africa. 3% of their ancestry traces to Neanderthals. We're talking around about 200 million Neanderthals. Neanderthals today are more successful than they ever were when they actually existed. <laughs> and that's meaningful. You know, they're part of our heritage. And I'm very sympathetic to these people. And I'll show you that in the history of anthropology, we have not always been sympathetic. The last Neanderthals that we know about lived here, Gibraltar. And the rock of Gibraltar, of course, is a famous image. Uh, here's Gibraltar from a further distance. And around the base of it, on the back side, are sea caves. Here they are. These sea caves today are right at sea level. And some of them are actually, the, the base of the caves are submerged. During the late Pleistocene, the sea level was much lower. And in fact, there was a plain that extended out around three kilometers in front of these caves. These caves were the closest shelter for the Neanderthals who were living here around about 30,000 years ago. And this cave in particular, Gorham's Cave, preserves the most recent evidence of Neanderthals known anywhere. If you say, where were the last Neanderthals? As far as we know, the last Neanderthals were at the very tip of Western Europe. There really was something that happened. There's a reason why the Neanderthal population doesn't exist anymore. Modern humans spread the genes that make up most of today's heritage 
were spreading with them. And Neanderthals were increasingly marginalized at the edges, the very edges of the world. Here's the excavation going on at Gorham's. Uh, my friend Clive Finlayson was with me in Israel last week, so I'm really pleased that I get to show his Gibraltar pictures. This is a great place to visit, by the way. Gibraltar is really, really nice. It's also a great place to shelter your money. <laughs> okay, I wouldn't know anything about that. Anthropologists are not, you know, we have no need of financial shelters. If we did, <laughs> we'd probably pick the Cayman Islands. Okay, um, so these are all, all the places that I've outlined here on the map are places where we have complete mitochondrial DNA sequences from Neanderthals. These are not all the Neanderthals. In fact, we have hundreds of Neanderthal sites. We have hundreds of Neanderthal skeletal specimens. I'll show you a few of those bones. Most of the bones that we find are bits and pieces. You know, a tooth here, part of a jaw there, part of a tibia in another place. You're gonna see the record is fragmentary and I'll show you very directly. But nowadays with genetics, we're adding another dimension to our knowledge of these people because we can study the genealogy of these people through their genetic relationships. I would just wanna emphasize as I start, Neanderthals are the people that lived between around 200,000 years ago and around 30,000 years ago. If I was giving this lecture 15 years ago, as I used to do, I would have said they're mainly European. We know that there are some in West Asia. Today, new evidence has cast a very different image of what their geographic range was. They extend all the way across Central Asia right to the Altai Mountains. We have Neanderthals here known today from their DNA, and they extend across a very vast geographic range. We now know from these mitochondrial DNA sequences that the greatest diversity of the Neanderthals is in the East. That this was principally a Central Asian population that once in a while was entering Europe. Europe is like the backwater and West Asia, Central Asia are Neanderthal central. That's hugely significant to us because it reflects what we understand about their adaptations. You know, these are people that are breaking stereotypes that we've had of them for a long time. This Neanderthal is not the first to have been discovered, nor was it the first to have been named, but it is from Gibraltar. This is the Forbes Quarry specimen, and it was found in 1848. When people found it, they didn't initially recognize that this was an ancient kind of person. I mean, here it is, it's a skull. And, okay, well, it's sort of funny looking, but, you know, there were weird people who used to live here, so maybe it's one of theirs. I like to start Neanderthals with this Gibraltar skull because this is the Neanderthal that was touched by Darwin. Darwin did not know much about the evidence of human evolution because there wasn't much. They had found just a couple of Neanderthals by the time Darwin was writing on the origin of species. They had not yet found any earlier hominins. Darwin made some projections about what they would find. Uh, Wallace, who was contemporary of Dar Darwin, co-inventor of natural selection, made predictions about what they would find. Ernst Haeckel, who was the German popularizer of Darwin, made predictions about what they would find, but they hadn't found anything yet except for a couple of Neanderthals. Darwin had this Gibraltar Neanderthal brought to him at Down House. He examined it. I like to think of you know, the Neanderthal coming there. And <laughs> in Darwin's study, where well, you're not supposed to take photographs, um, <laughs> you've got the glass. If you've seen this movie Creation, where they have the, the buff Darwin, you know, the, and his wife, Jennifer Connelly. Um, <laughs> you, you see him using this glass and, and examining specimens, and I think that's sort of, you can just imagine him having this Neanderthal there, and that's the evidence that there was of our evolution at the time that he was writing. We've come a long way since then, but it was a curvy route. And I'll just show you that this is the Neanderthal that gave the Neanderthals their names. It's from the Neander Valley. The Neander Valley is outside of Dusseldorf. And today the closest town is Metmon, but there's a train stop that says Neanderthal. If you guys have seen Neanderthal written with a T, 
a Neanderthal written with a TH, it dates to this time. In Germany, in this time period, about 1856 is when this is found. In Germany, they weren't spelling things the way that they said them. They were spelling them with the archaic H. And in every European language except English, this makes no difference at all. However, in English, it comes into our language and people see it written Neanderthal, and they say Neanderthal. Neanderthal is a bad word. It means, well, you guys know what it means. Uh, it depends which political party you are, what it means, right? <laughs> I'm nonpartisan up here. Um, Neanderthal, I like to say Neanderthal, many anthropologists like to say Neanderthal because we like to break stereotypes. Um, and the place is said Neanderthal. And in fact, when it came into English, it's spelled Neanderthalensis. They give it a species name, Homo Neanderthalensis, but with a TH. In Latin, you don't say the H. So again, you don't have this problem, but if you're committed to the idea that there are different species than us, then Neanderthal is your spelling. I'm not, and many of us aren't. And so we have this sort of use of words that reflects the way that we think about the past. Neanderthal, the skull, you can see, has initially, you, know, you see immediately, this is not somebody that you're going to see on the street. It's got this brow ridge that sticks out in front of it. If we look at its skeleton, its bones are very large in their articular surfaces. I'll just point out, the head of this femur is about like this. Mine is probably about like this. You know, these bones had a lot of force transmitted through their joints. The bones are curved and very thick. These are powerful bones. They're much more heavily affected by osteoarthritis during the course of their lives than we are. Um, those are all signs that they're living a hard lifestyle. They're adapted to a lot of activity. And it's easy to take that too far. I mean, somebody who's lecturing about Neanderthals will get you imagining this muscular sort of weightlifter. The truth is that when you look at the bones of weightlifters, they look like this. They are thickened. They are very dense and strong. But these people were not bulky people. Males of Neanderthals averaged about five foot six. So they're sort of wiry people. Imagine them like wrestlers, not like, not like professional wrestlers, but like college wrestlers, you know, <laughs> bandy-legged, tough. They were hunter-gatherers. They had a high lean body mass proportion. Um, but they're different from what most people are in the world now. Neanderthal, by the way, is a beautiful place. Um, in the 1850s because it had this dramatic gorge. You know, it was one of these pretty places like the Driftless area of Wisconsin. Um, but it was totally quarried out. Uh, and this is when they found the skeleton, was when they were blasting in this. Um, what remains today is just this pillar of rock. And, and when I went to the site the first time, this was a gravel parking lot in a junkyard. It was actually a junkyard with junk and dogs barking. And uh, this was bought by the German government and restored as a park. So we now have these rods that tell us where the cave was. And there are these monumental crosses. This is very German, right? Um, they're all concrete. And one of these has in it the initial 300 base pairs that were found from this skeleton when they sequenced its mitochondrial DNA in 1997. This was the first discovery of Neanderthal DNA anywhere. It was just a tiny part, 300 base pairs. Earlier this year, the data became available from a specimen from another site in the Altai Mountains, a Neanderthal, in which the genome, all three billion base pairs, is covered about 60 times on average. This is high density sequencing. It's the sort of thing that we today do medically for modern humans where we're trying to discover what mysteries, you know, what mysterious causes they might have of disease. We have this kind of data for Neanderthals. This is done by the Max Planck Institute. No, no, no. Yes, continue, continue. All right. 
This is done by the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, uh, Svante Pebo and his colleagues. The 300 base pairs on one of these crosses. If you tried to put the 3 billion base pairs copied 60 times, so 180 billion base pairs on an equivalent monument, it would be 20 kilometers across. So that's how much the data have exploded during the last 15 years. In fact, much of this increase has happened just within the last five years. Today, we're dealing with data of an enormous scale, three billion base pairs of Neanderthal. Now, we've got lots of skeletal evidence of Neanderthals, but they're limited in what they can tell us. The genetics tells us about other aspects of their biology that we could never observe from the skeleton. It tells us potentially about their muscles, about their digestive system, about the diseases that they carried, their immunity. And we're learning about these things. That's pretty exciting. And it's really transforming the way that we think about them. Let's think about the way that people used to think about Neanderthals. This is from the Field Museum. Um, not nowadays, but from the 19-teens. And Neanderthals, these were not history's intellectuals. <laughs> if anything, they were either stupid or savage. And when you see reconstructions of them like this, understand there's a grain of reality in this. This is a reconstruction of the La Chapelle Sans specimen. And it's hunched over like this, and it's got this sort of uh, look. The fact is that this specimen had lost all of his teeth but one by the time he died, and he died at about age 45 or 50. He is one of the oldest known Neanderthals in terms of how old he was when he died. Two-thirds of Neanderthals are dead. If they made it to adulthood, they're all the ones that are adults, two-thirds of them are dead by age 30. So this is a population that lives a hard lifestyle. The La Chapelle specimen lost all of his teeth except for one, had extreme osteoarthritis in his joints. He did walk around like this. And that was survival. That was a challenge that he survived with for years and years. These are the first group of people that we begin to see a real contribution of your group to your survival. Right? This is a a population in which the older individuals are kept around for some reason. Presumably for the same reason we keep around older people now. <laughs> They're benefactors. <laughs> for Neanderthals, these are small scale hunting and gathering groups. This is largely about information, we think. So that you're the microphone is dodging in and out. Let's see. It says it's OK. Let's give it a. All right. It's possible that I'm getting feedback from being too close to the other one. So I'll try over here for a little bit and see if that helps. Um, yes, this is about information. Well, of course, our viewpoint ranges from <laughs> stupid to comical. including in, nowadays, commercials. And even in the scientific world, we have this history of looking at them as if they were, you know, we know that Neanderthals are dumb. Why? Because they're gone. I mean, it really doesn't go much further than that. And I want to emphasize that the way that archaeology has progressed has really transformed our view of what these ancient people were like. This is one of the first phylogenies, a uh, tree of relationships representing human evolution. And this phylogeny has Homo sapiens at the top. This is drawn by Ernst Haeckel, who was a German contemporary of Darwin. Homo sapiens at the top. We've got all kinds of other primates down here. And I give you the one that you actually can't read from there to save the punchline, because this is one that has a place for Neanderthals. They're right here, and immediate antecedents to humans. They're called Homo stupidus. 
Stupidus meaning that they couldn't talk. They were mute. And if there's one thing that we recognize as being human, it is the fact that we talk to each other. This is something that's fundamentally human. It's something that's not shared with any other creatures. They have their own forms of communication, but none of them are verbal. None of them are linguistic communication. We have learned a lot about the Neanderthals and communication in the last several years. This skeleton from Kabara Cave, also in Mount Carmel, I was at, outside Kabara last week also, uh, has a hyoid bone. This is a bone in the throat. I'll show you a couple here. These are hyoids from an earlier site, uh, from Atapuerca in Spain. These hyoid bones are the only bone in your body that reflects the shape of your vocal tract. And they don't reflect it all that well, but these are different from the one that we have earlier in human evolution. The evidence, as far as we know it, from the vocal auditory tract, including some genetics of the inner ear and the morphology of the throat, suggests that their vocal auditory tract in Neanderthals had adapted in a human-like way. That's not real satisfying, right? That's like saying, well, okay, the voice is there, potentially. The ears are there. In humans, the voice and the ears have co-adapted with language. So it's very probable that Neanderthals have some form of language. Archaeology tends to back this up. Here are pigment crayons. Now, you look at them and you say, these are hunks of rock. They're hunks of rock of a mineral called manganese dioxide, which is black pigment. It's still used industrially as a black pigment. They, as you can see, have these striations on them. Microscopically, these striations have the anatomy of striations that are used on a soft material as opposed to a hard material. These aren't sidewalk chalks. They're pigments that have been used on hides or skin, something soft. We have pigments from a lot of Neanderthal sites. Here's a, a shell from southern Spain, and this is a shell, it's a scallop shell, and as you can see on one side, this is one side, this is the opposite side. Same thing, front and back. On one side, it has this natural band of pigment. This is the way the scallop is made. On the other side, Neanderthals have taken red ochre and put in the corresponding band of pigment. Here's a bunch of shells that they collected. All of them have holes in them. They didn't drill these holes. Uh, these holes are drilled by a marine snail. Uh, snails are awful creatures sometimes. Some of them are predators of these clams. And yet Neanderthals gathered the ones with the holes and carried them up to their place. They didn't gather the ones without the holes. They were stringing them on something. Neanderthals late in their existence are making these complicated bone tools. They're beginning to play with projectile weaponry. And from several sites now, we have evidence of the distal wing bones of birds, raptors, vultures, eagles, the distal wing bones with systematic cut marks on them. These are not cut marks to take the meat off, as you know from birds, there's no meat on the distal parts. These are cut marks that correspond with feather removal. So our Neanderthals are decorating themselves with feathers. This weekend, there's a new paper, I love it, that shows evidence from a Neanderthal site. This is a microscope view of the edge of a stone flake from a Neanderthal site. It has this fiber on it. This is a plant fiber. As you can see, the plant fiber is twisted. This is among the first evidence that we have of Neanderthals making string. These forensic methods that are looking very carefully at the traces of behavior that are left in archaeology have begun to transform our view of what Neanderthals are capable of. By looking in detail at the edges of stone tools, and instead of, as in the old days, washing off the stone tools, right? You want them to be clean so they look nice in your museum, so you just wash them off. <laughs> instead of doing that now, people are examining them microscopically. They're taking trace evidence from the edges. They're taking trace evidence from the calculus in teeth. Now, I know you guys, you all go to the dentist, 
and the dentist, the hygienist, is scraping at them, right? He's just scraping, he's scraping. This is called tartar. The toothpaste companies want to sell you their tartar removal toothpaste so that you don't have to endure the scraping. Tartar is what anthropologists call calculus, and it is your body's defense strategy against plaque. What do you do when you have a biofilm of plaque accumulating on your teeth that's starting to dissolve them? Calcify it. Your saliva calcifies this so that it's encased and the bacteria aren't able to damage your teeth as much. Now, ultimately, that's still not that great, and so it's probably right for the hygienist to scrape it off. But before there were dental hygienists, this calculus built up on teeth, and as it's doing so, it's accumulating tiny food particles, and those food particles still embedded in this calcified substance after tens of thousands of years have begun to tell us what foods Neanderthals are eating. We have, from this calculus, Amanda Henry, who's a, who's a good friend of mine, also in the Max Planck Institute, has been looking at starch granules. Starch comes, when you haven't cooked it, in these very tight, very hard granules, and those granules become embedded in the calculus and survive to the present day, and they're identifiable by species, so you can tell what species of plants are being eaten. We've got lots of evidence from animal bones about Neanderthal foods. You've heard of Neanderthals being carnivores. Yeah, we've got lots of animal bones. Bison, horse, red deer. They're eating lots of these big animals. The chemistry of their bones indicates also that they're carnivores. They're eating a lot of these big animals. But their teeth are telling us about the plants that they're eating. They're eating cattails. They're eating oats. They're eating other kinds of grains. And in some cases, because those starch granules loosen when you cook them, which is how oatmeal goes from something that you have to grind to something that you can gum, those loosen when you cook them, there's evidence of that loosening in the calculus of the Neanderthal teeth. Neanderthals are cooking grains. Now you imagine this is quite a trick, right, if you don't have pots. And you start thinking, well, what does that mean for technology, right? Because the Neanderthals are cooking grains. It's not like roasting on a spit, right? You can't take grain and roast it on a spit. You've got to have it in some sort of container. Scots people do this. They stuff it inside of a stomach. Haggis, right? Southeast Asian people do it. They take it and stuff it inside of leaves and make packets of leaves. You're steaming the grain inside of there. This is what Neanderthals were doing. We would have no clue about it if not for the increase in technology that enables us to look in more detail at what's going on with their archaeological remains. And that's a theme about the last 10 years of studying these ancient people. We've been looking under the proverbial street lamp. Right? We study what we can see, and what we can see are bones and stones. But once you widen the scope of your search by looking at the microscopic evidence, by looking at the genetic evidence, you begin to discover things that were not clear to you before. We're able to trace very small fractions of ancestry with genetics. We're able to trace very small traces of behavior with microscopes and with chemistry. By carefully mapping sites, I just want to point this out, you show that Neanderthals are using different kinds of things in different areas of a site. They're structuring their behavior. That's something that humans do, and it's fundamentally social. And you also find the phytoliths that represent plant remains that come from particular species of plants. So you can reconstruct what's going on in this site. They're making a windbreak out of brush because we find the phytoliths, the, the little stones that grow inside of plants. They're silica-based stones inside of plant tissues. Um, you find uh, plant food processing in this area. You find bone and antler work in this area and an area where there's straw that's laid down for bedding. All of this stuff becomes clear to you when you have the technology to recover it. When you can study the composition of the rocks that they're using at different sites and you survey 
half of a continent to find the raw material sources of these, you begin to realize that they're trading things over long distances of hundreds of kilometers. Before, you would look at this and say, well, there's some exotic stone in here. Now we can say where it came from. Neanderthals, in a couple of cases, are trading shells that came from fossil deposits. Fossil shells that come from a particular place, and they trade them over long distances. They don't look like the stupidest that we thought that they were. They really are acting fundamentally like humans. Now, whether they're exactly like humans or not, well, we're all not exactly like each other either, are we? And that makes it a difficult problem for us anthropologists. What parts of what we see today are essential? What explains that 97% of our genetics comes from one little area of the world and these people didn't contribute a lot of it? There must be some explanation for that. The explanation doesn't appear to be obvious in their behavior. Well, this is what a really great Neanderthal assemblage looks like. This is my favorite Neanderthal assemblage of bones. This is from Krapina, which is in Croatia. It is the single largest accumulation of Neanderthal bones anywhere in the world. This is my friend Jakov Radovcic, who until recently was a curator of the collection. Um, this is our normal form. This is what I'm used to dealing with as an anthropologist. It's not beautiful skeletons, but it's beautiful to me because you can see that there are many copies of each part. They're broken copies, but you can start to study their variability. It is only recently that we've been able to do this with genetics. And I'll show you this little part of a bone. It's from Vindia Cave. It's also in Croatia. This is the first bone to have produced substantial genome evidence from a Neanderthal. This bone was not recognized as being a hominid when it was first discovered. It was tossed in a box with the faunal bones, the animal bones. This is what today is generating most of our knowledge about Neanderthal peoples. These little pieces of bone that didn't mean anything anatomically. This is a piece of a shin bone. It's a piece of a tibia. This is the place, Vindia Cave. Vindia is, to me, just like the Driftless area of Wisconsin. I mean, it's really this sort of beautiful place outside of it. And it's at the edge of the glaciers. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a temperate place throughout all of the late Pleistocene. Three Vindia bones, all of them anatomically basically worthless, all of them have produced a complete genome. I want to very quickly show you that mechanically, this is the sort of thing that we can do now with genes. I'm going to show you what the limits of it are, how little we actually understand when we're looking at a gene, and what it will take to learn more. So let me just give you a quick example. I'm going to use as an example a paper that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, this is about glucose transporters. Glucose transporters are proteins that enable your cells to take up sugar. And it happens that there are many different glucose transporters in the human genome. Many of them are active in different kinds of tissues. And I'm going to look in particular at one. Here we are. Uh, this is SLC2A1. Genes have names like this. You don't have to know what they are. In fact, the computers have to know what they are. For us, it, su it suffices to know that this is a sugar transporter. It's taking sugar out of the bloodstream and getting it into cells. And these bars represent where it's active. So here in muscle tissue, this is not very active. In liver tissue, it's not very active. In brain tissue, it's active. So this is a sugar transporter for the brain. And it's much more active in humans than it is in chimpanzees or in rhesus monkeys. So sugar transport brain, active in humans, much less so than other primates. That's what we know about this gene. Now, you could immediately hypothesize why we would want to have more sugar uptake in our brain than other primates do. It's because we have these giant brains. It seems like this could be essential to fueling the brain. And that doesn't tell you a lot, but it does give you some of the mechanics of what's necessary in order to have big brains. You have to transport sugar. 
we know something about the evolution of this gene. When we compare humans to chimpanzees, a key question is, why do we express more of this than they do? But how does it come to be that we're making more of this in our brain than they are? And the answer is that in one part of this gene, the untranslated region 5 prime, so that's upstream of it, in one part of this gene, humans have a bunch of changes relative to the common ancestor of humans and chimps. Chimps don't have any. For the other parts of the gene, there's no big story. So what's going on is that this gene is expressed in humans, it's upregulated more, because it has sequence changes that are upregulating it. All right, that's mechanical. Right? It's just saying, how does the gene work? Nowadays, anybody, high school students, my undergraduates, anybody can look at the human gene sequence and determine what's going on with it. And anybody can look at Neanderthal genetic data and see what's going on with that. The genome browser is totally free to everybody. Your tax dollars have paid for it. When you said, the human genome, we've got to sequence it, they had to develop the tools to look at it. Here's the tools to look at it. Here's the human sequence of this part of that gene, the part that's regulating the activity of the gene. Here you see humans are different from other primates. The other primates, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, rhesus monkeys, marmosets, tarsiers, we have genome projects for all of these. And here they are. And where they're like us, there's a dot. And where they're different, there's a letter. Here's a case where we're different from every other primate that we looked at. And here are Neanderthal sequences. And if they were different from us, you would see a letter here. And in fact, you do see some letters. These letters represent, in all likelihood, damage to the DNA that's been encased in the ground for all this time. You can't just take a Neanderthal sequence and trust it. It's broken all over the place because it's been fragmented underground for tens of thousands of years. But if you know what you're looking at, you can use it as a genotype. You can say, ah, oh, here. What are the odds that it would be broken at just this place to look just like us? Well, the odds of that are low. So we think probably they share with us these two changes that upregulate this gene that make it active more in the big human brain. That's the mechanics of what we do to study genetics. I've very carefully laid out at each stage what we've concluded, and it's not very much. Right? This is a lot of work to actually conclude very little. Of course they had to have sugar in their brain. They had big brains like us. But when it comes to genetics, it's telling you a very key thing. We are not limited in our understanding of Neanderthal genetics by the availability of data. The data are here. We are limited by our understanding of human genetics. If we know more about how human genes work, we will know more about how Neanderthal genes work. And that's pretty exciting, because it means that for the first time in anthropological history, we don't have to look at a blank wall and make stuff up. <laughs> we can look at a wall that's covered in graffiti and try to interpret it. And our interpretation depends on what we can study in living people. So when you hear about humans understanding more and more about how the human genome works, understand that the Neanderthal data are now helping us because they tell us where we came from. Okay, I'm going to zoom through a couple of things. Neanderthals are remarkable sometimes. This is Shanidar Cave in Iraq. Uh, Shanidar has just been reopened. There's new excavations going on there. In the 1960s, they found this. Uh, these are the two humeri of the first skeleton from Shanidar. There's several skeletons there. And you can see this one is totally atrophied away. This is a Neanderthal that lived with an amputation. He also had one of his eyes probably blinded during his life. One of his feet was lame. I say Neanderthals lived with challenges. Many of them lived with challenges. This is not the only amputation we have. We have one from Krapina also. Genetics is telling us new things about them. For example, you go to museums nowadays and you'll see a lot of red-headed Neanderthals. What is going on with this? 
they have a version of the gene called MC1R that in humans varies between red-headed people and dark-haired people. Blonde people are caused by different genetic changes. Sometimes blonde overlaps with the red-headed change, so you get strawberry blonde and auburn and you know, all these wonderful colors. Um, we don't really know what color Neanderthal hair was because we don't have all the genes that contribute to pigmentation interpreted in them. But we do know that they had a genetic change in some Neanderthals that functionally would have made the hair red. There's a fact about them. They had this genetic change. Their MC1R protein should have had less activity that should have made their hair red, all things being equal. Funky. <laughs> that was totally accidental. It comes to me after I say hunky, no. Um, this is David Reich, uh, and David is responsible for determining more than anybody else, responsible for determining this 3% Neanderthal that we all have. And I want to give just a quick overview of how he did it, because it is such a simple thing. It was a, such a great idea. All things being equal, you and I are more likely to be alike, and the Neanderthal is more likely to be different. But there are two other possibilities. The two other possibilities is that for any gene in our genome, you might be like a Neanderthal, or I might be like a Neanderthal. Those are just the logical possibilities. More often than not, you and I will be connected and the Neanderthal will be different. But there are cases. So for example, blood type. I'm blood type O. O, for the ABO system, you guys know it's A, B, O, and A, B. It's because there are two functional versions of that gene, A and B. If you have a copy of each of those, then your blood type AB. There's a non-functional version of it, O. O is a broken version of this gene. Some Neanderthals are blood type O. Some of them are blood type A, as we now know. So if I'm type O and you're type A, you could say that, well, I'm more like those Neanderthals than I'm like you. And that's quite true. But for some other gene, maybe you're more like Neanderthals than me. We, in fact, know that O blood originated two and a half million years ago, sometime well before the origin of Neanderthals and humans. If I'm O and Neanderthals O, we probably got it from our common ancestors. We're cousins. That doesn't mean that the Neanderthal is necessarily my grandparent. However, if it turned out that we looked across the entire genome and systematically I was more like the Neanderthal than you, that would be really hard to explain by, as a function of us both being equally related to Neanderthals. One of us, me, presumably, would be more like the Neanderthal because I'm more related to the Neanderthal, because I have Neanderthal ancestors. And in fact, when we look at human populations, that's exactly what we find. More often than not, people who live outside of Africa in pre-Columbian times are like the Neanderthal, and people who live inside of Africa are less like the Neanderthal. Both Africans and non-Africans share Neanderthal-like characteristics, but the non-Africans share them about 5% more. That's the signature of Neanderthal contribution to those populations. It's that it's systematic and across the genome that enables us to understand that it's a contribution. However, that doesn't tell us exactly what it is. You might imagine, and if I said, well, I'm 3% Neanderthal, that I would know that, well, it's because of this gene and that gene and this other gene. In fact, we don't know that. I know which ones I share with Neanderthals, but I don't know which ones I got from Neanderthals. I just know that I got 3% of them because I have 3% more than most Sub-Saharan Africans do. Now, in my lab, we've been studying this more systematically with larger samples of people. Um, if you look across lots and lots of people, and the shared with Neanderthal scale goes up the chart here, uh, Africans have less, Europeans have more, and Asians have a little bit more than Europeans. Today, East Asians are more Neanderthal-like than Europeans are. 
If we look at mixed populations, so African Americans who are uh, ancestrally a mixture of Africans and some European and some Native American, um, you'll see they're a little bit more Neanderthal-like than Africans with a lot of dispersion among them. Likewise in Puerto Rico, similar population mix but with more European and Native American, uh, less African. Uh, you'll see they're also intermediate. And it actually varies within regions. So in Southern Europe, you get a little bit more. In Northern Europe, you get a little bit less. Neanderthal ancestry is something of a tracer of population history. We can now use this to understand where people came from. OK. Oh, and one of my favorite examples, this is something we've also done in my lab. This is uh, the Tyrolean Iceman, uh, Utzi the Iceman. He was found in Italy, uh, near the border of Austria, coming out of a glacier. And we now have his complete genome. He's been studied for all kinds of things. I'm sure you've seen him in the news. Uh, but we look to see how Neanderthal he was. And he's more Neanderthal-like than Europeans today. So this has changed in the course of European history. Today's Europeans are not yesterday's Europeans. Things have been changing. Much more European, uh, much more Neanderthal-like than Southern Europeans now, who are genetically most like him. But this aspect of his biology has changed. Not so much more than Asians. Europe has been recolonized substantially since the invention of agriculture, a couple of times. And that's reflected in the proportion of Neanderthal that you see in these people. Let me take it back to Mount Carmel, because I mentioned that this is the area of the world where Neanderthals and modern humans were encountering each other as modern humans left Africa. And that makes it very important for anthropologists and archaeologists. This is Amud Cave, which is just north of the Sea of Galilee, and I was there on Thursday. Um, so we've got, Amud means column, and there's this huge column right out in front of the cave. It's got two openings. Amud has produced this skull, and it comes with a skeleton. This is a Neanderthal-like skull. It's got this brow ridge in front of it. It's a long skull. It's barrel-shaped. Its maximum width is about halfway up. It's not higher. Here's a modern human skull from School, which is that cave in Mount Carmel that I showed you. And it's a higher skull. It still has a brow ridge, but its face is tucked in underneath of that frontal lobe of its brain a little bit. It's got a higher forehead. It's a shorter skull. It's more rounded. That's what separates modern humans from Neanderthals morphologically. But this Neanderthal doesn't have many of the characteristics of European Neanderthals. It doesn't have a projection in the back of its skull, this occipital bun that other Neanderthals have. It doesn't have a tiny mastoid process that you feel it here behind your ear. It has a great big one, like much more big than this school individual. It doesn't have a skeleton that's five foot six and bandy legged. It has a tall skeleton. It's about six feet tall. It's the least Neanderthal like of the Neanderthals. And here it is in the population where modern humans and Neanderthals were encountering each other. We have potentially the evidence of this interaction. And we're now learning what its importance is genetically. At last, we're able to put together multiple sources of evidence about these ancient people and interpret how human they were and how Neanderthal we are. We're not identical to them. We're not the last Neanderthals in that sense. It's not like there's a parallel world and the Neanderthals are still on it, living human-like existences, and they transport across and see that, oh, they're just like us, except a little bit different. That's famously the plot of a science fiction novel. Um, it's not like that. But inside of Africa and outside of Africa 50,000, 100,000 years ago, there were parallel cultural worlds. And these people were doing similar kinds of things. And they began to encounter each other. And now that we can look at that and start thinking about what it is that makes these people different, 
we're very likely to discover it's not what we anticipated. Maybe it's disease. Maybe it's efficiency. Maybe it's the way the muscles worked. Maybe it's something that's invisible to us in the archaeological record, but important to them. The exciting thing is that I think we're going to figure out what it is. And when we figure it out, we'll know a lot about the pathway by which we became human. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it off there. And yeah, I don't want to go any further. But I do want to mention, for those of you who are interested in this topic, um, we're doing a massive open online course in Wisconsin. You guys have heard of these MOOCs. Um, and our massive open online course is called Human Evolution Past and Future. Uh, it is totally free for anybody to sign up. It begins in January. Uh, you can find it on Coursera, the website. You can find it by searching for Human Evolution Past and Future. I'm mentioning it now because part of why I've been traveling around to Israel, Africa, other places, is to film the components of this course. So we're going to archaeological sites and presenting them firsthand uh, and doing interviews with the people who are doing the work there. So if you're interested in this topic and want to follow it up and see where this is going, you can get a much broader point of view by doing that. And all the videos will be available online on YouTube, in the course. And uh, I hope that a lot of you will sign up. We've got 23,000 people now <laughs> from everywhere in the world. The topic is human evolution, past and future. On Coursera. <laughs> on Coursera, yeah. I said 23,000 people now, there's 20% of them are US. After that, it's Brazil, India, the UK, and Spain. It is really. Spell Coursera. Coursera is course with an RA after it. Coursera. Yep. All right. All right, so thank you, and I'll be happy to take any of your questions. Could you compare uh, the level of culture when you showed the, um, the site uh -huh. and all its division with uh, Homo sapiens sapien uh, culture at a comparable time? Yeah, what we're seeing in these sites is that the spatial distribution of things in Neanderthals is fundamentally like what we're seeing in the Middle Stone Age of Africa. Where we have sites, not every site preserves that kind of structure. But where they do, it's the same. The transport of raw materials is fundamentally similar, although in some parts of Africa, it's, it's yet further. Uh, in Ethiopia, they're transporting obsidian really systematically across fairly long distances, um, really regularly. Um, the use of plant remains. In Africa, you have some sites beginning around 80,000 years ago where people are accumulating stores of grains. We don't have that yet for Neanderthals, but we see the use of the same grains. Um, looking at the use of ornamental objects, like shells, you see it in South Africa, beginning around 100,000 years ago. You see it in the Levant, at, at, at Kafsa Cave, around 100,000 years ago. You see it in Neanderthals, starting around 100,000 years ago. Um, pigments. We've got some evidence of pigment use in Europe about 200,000 years ago. Uh, a lot of evidence after 50,000 years. You've got a good amount of evidence for pigment use in, in Africa starting around 80,000 years ago. It could easily have been earlier. So all of these things are co-appearing, let's say. Co-evolving, we don't know. I think people are experimenting. They're coming upon new solutions for things, and sometimes those last, and often they don't. They're experiments that don't take off for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So this is like double question. First, could you imagine something in between Neanderthal and human? Mm -hmm. And secondly, how you really get the three percent to your DNA from Neanderthal? How did it happen, yes. or how do we determine it? No, how did it happen? How did it happen? Yes, but how determine? I understand by sequence. Okay, so so the question is. How is it that modern humans got 3% of their DNA from Neanderthals? <laughs> I've got to say, I work with television producers sometimes. And one of them asked me this, right? How do you imagine this happening? 
Because you know we have to film something. <laughs> and I say, well, you have two options. It's either Quest for Fire or Dances with Wolves. <laughs> and the difference is the music, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> But th there, is a serious, but I, I, there is a serious question in there, right? Which is, do you imagine that this is just like people encounter each other and, and they fall in love? You know, like they're really culturally compatible? Or is this, or is it kidnapping? Is it, oh, I haven't seen a woman for so long and... <laughs> is there some way to tell? At the moment, there is not a way to tell. We think that some of the, uh, th there's less evidence of this mixture in the X chromosome than there is in other parts of the genome. So that, that may mean that there is a sex differential in what's going on. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it yet, but, but it may be pointing in that direction. Um, otherwise, we don't know. And I think, fundamentally, what I think is going on is very much like what happens when modern humans have encountered each other in the last 500 years. Sometimes it's violent, sometimes it's aggressive, sometimes it's romantic, sometimes it's a matter of convenience. What we can say is that this is not populations that are so different that they're inviolable hybrids. You know, these are populations that are more different from people now, but nevertheless still fully compatible with each other. But the second part. Mm -hmm. What would the hybrids be? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to this, because this is interesting. Um, here's a Neanderthal trait. It's a, little, it's, a, it's a stupid little trait. It's that on the mandible, on the inside, if you go to the dentist and they have to deaden your mandibular teeth, so your lower teeth, they will give you an injection, and they try to hit this spot, because this is where the nerve enters. And in most living people now, this spot is a long groove that's really easy for the dentist to hit. Dental students practice this on each other with saline solution. <laughs> yeah, thought that'd get you. Um, Neanderthals often have this bridged across with bone. All right, as far as we know, that makes no difference at all. This is the frequency of that trait. In Neanderthals, it's about half of them. In the first people in Europe who followed the Neanderthals, it's about 20% of them. In later upper Paleolithic people, it's less than 10%. In Mesolithic people, it's about 2%. It declines over time. If you say, what are the people who are the products of this mixture? It's things like this. They have a mixture of traits, but it's not a regular mixture of traits. It's just the result of recombination, of getting different combinations of things. Yeah. Hi. Um, I read recently about a discovery of a skull which the media made out to be some sort of complete revolution in the way that we think about the history. I'd like to have a real scientific um, take on what that actually was. Yeah, uh, th the media are always doing this. And, and it's okay, I don't mind so much. In this case, it's, there's a reason to be excited about it. Um, I was in Georgia this summer and, and got to study the skull a little bit. It's a skull of early Homo erectus. And what's, it's about 1.8 million years old. This is the first sample of Homo erectus that left Africa. Now, the entire sample is not new. Uh, we've known for more than 10 years that there's a sample of, of Homo erectus at this site. It's called Dimenisi. It's in the Republic of Georgia. This skull is interesting because it has a unique combination of features of Homo erectus and features that are very robust and not characteristic of erectus. It has a very small brain relative to the rest of its sample. And in fact, it's the smallest erectus brain known. It's about 550 milliliters. Uh, the average erectus is about 850 to 1,000. This sample of erectus, very early erectus, they're about 600 to 800 cubic centimeters. So this one is much smaller. It's in fact smaller than most of the skulls of Homo habilis. The interpretation that the discoverers gave to it was, look, if you look at the anatomies that are in this sample, which is really variable, but represent a population that was all in this place within a couple of centuries of each other, and compare that to the variation that you see in Africans of the same time period that you've assigned to different species, the variation is not different. 
The different species case, if they were really different species, ought to be more variable than this one site. And so their interpretation is that the different species case isn't different species. That you've been calling them these different things because you found them in different places and you've interpreted them as variable, but in fact, the variability is the same as in one sample from one place from one time. I tend to agree with that. I think that that's a really powerful way of looking at things once you have a sample. You can see what it means when we look at Neanderthals and you start having a larger sample of things. It's not the one complete skull, I mean, that tells you something, but having a sample of variability tells you how that variability overlaps with other samples. And that's what we're discovering for these early Homo erectus. And we're out of time, so thank you right. very much, Professor Hawks. Thank you.